has science disproved the existence of God? What do y'all think? Has science disproved the existence of God? Now, the question has a fallacy. The question itself is wrong. Why? Exactly. If you're really talking science, science is not in the business of disproving things. Science is in the business of proving things. Now, let's say, I'll give you some examples. Um, all right, well, science cannot prove the non-existence of anything. Why? It's based on observations. Very good. Very good. Why else? It assumes what? For you to prove or to prove the non-existence of something or someone, it, it, it implies what? Omniscience. In other words, when you say science has proven that God doesn't exist, you're implying that you have become God. Because you have to know everything. As Nick Sayedna gave us the example of knowing everything about one thing or knowing, what is the other example, Sayedna? One, one, or one thing about everything. Exactly. You, you, you claim omniscience once you say science has proven that this thing doesn't exist. Let me give you an illustration. I mean, analogy will, will help illustrate. If I say to you, I believe that there is a stone um, somewhere in this world that is about three inches deep and it's, uh, it's brownish color that if you were to flip it on its side, you'll find yellow dots that are symmet symmetrically positioned and so on and so forth. It does exist somewhere in this universe. You come to me and you say, it doesn't exist and science proved it doesn't exist. What does that imply? That you've searched the entire universe, omniscience, you know, uh, knowing all. And, and we're not able to find that stone that I'm referring to. So science is not in the business, business of disproving things, um, but proving. And that's the difference between the deductive and the inductive reasoning. Any of you are familiar with these? I'm not going to get into them too much. But there are two different methods of reasoning. Science deals with the inductive methods. One, the deductive method is a top-down approach. The inductive is the bottoms-up approach. I'm not going to get into it, um, but just very briefly for the sake of discussion. The deductive methods begins with a theory from the general to the specific. The inductive goes from the specific observations to the general. Some examples. Deductive reasoning, with, and this is used in, in philosophy more so, and it's more conclusive. Deductive reasoning is more conclusive than inductive reasoning. And science, again, uses inductive reasoning. I'll give you an example of, an, uh, of a deductive reasoning. Um, I, need to be, uh, I need to be at church at 9 o'clock. And it takes me half an hour from my house to go to church. Therefore, I need to leave my house at 8.30. That's deductive reasoning. You see, from the general to the specific. Inductive, you just reverse it. You look at observations. Observations, as you mentioned, this is what science. And then you study patterns of this observation, and you develop a theory, like the evolutionary theory of, of Darwin. Okay? It's inductive, not deductive. But let's not get into that so much. But science cannot disprove the existence of something, nor can it uh, approve or prove the non-existence of something or someone for that matter. Let me tell you about Richard Dawkins. I mentioned him quite a bit because he's, uh, um, again, one of the topics of our discussion has to revolve around his ideology because of his influence in this discipline, in this field. In January 2005, the Oxford atheist and Dar uh, Darwinist Richard Dawkins was publicly asked what he believed to be true but could not prove what he believed to be true but could not prove this was an interesting question because he's on record as saying that you should not believe anything that has no evidence he's on record of saying you should not believe anything without evidence remember he ascribes to what's called the scientific atheism this is what he said, I believe, now, this is quoted from him, I believe but I cannot prove that all life, all intelligence, all creativity, and all design anywhere in the universe in the, is a direct or indirect product of Darwinian natural selection. That's what he believes, but 
he can't prove it. At least I give him credit for his honesty. At least I give him credit for his honesty. All right, so science cannot disprove the existence of something or prove the non-existence of something, you see. Um, science also, or Christianity, uh, many argue, many argue that Christianity is a foundation of modern science. In other words, you cannot really tr truly claim yourself to be a scientist with the true sense of uh, the meaning of the word, word scientist without presupposing Christian beliefs. I'll give you some examples or some quotations from scientists. Um, I have their credentials, but no, not their names. Nice. Okay, I'll get you their names in a second. A Christian does not have to pretend to be an atheist to do science. A Christian does not have to pretend to be an atheist to do science. Science arises naturally from a Christian worldview. Christianity is not a separate realm from science, but provides a fundamental foundation for how and why we do science. A scientist, listen to this, a scientist does not have to be a Christian to do science but must hold the subset of worldviews assumptions. You're borrowing from the Christian worldview as an assumption to your scientific endeavors. Okay. Melvin Calvin here, get this guy's name. He's a Nobel Prize winner, biochemist awarded the National Medal of Science, 1989. He says, I seem to find this basic notion discovered 2000 or 3000 years ago and enunciated first in the Western world by the ancient Hebrews. Namely, that the universe is governed by a single God. This monotheistic view seemed to be the historical foundation for modern science. And lastly, Dr. Rodney Stark, very famous sociologist of religion and scientist, he says, great deal of knowledge was gathered by observation and by trial and error in all ancient cultures. Listen to this. But this is not science. Aristotle, for example, observed widely and theorized extensively, but he did not test his theories against his observations, so he was not a scientist. He was only a philosopher. Alchemy and astrology were highly developed in China, Egypt, India, and Greece, and Rome. But only in medieval Europe did these become the sciences of what? Chemistry and physics and astronomy. It is the consensus among contemporary historians, philosophers, and sociologists of science that real science arose only once in Europe. The leading scientific figures in the 16th and 17th centuries were overwhelmingly devout Christians who believed in their duty to comprehend, comprehend God's handiwork. Christianity serves as a foundation for perfect science, as Sayyidina mentioned, the expression perfect science or true science. Lastly, I wanted to share with you some famous scientists who, and to be accurate, um, I'm not going to say these are famous Christians um, scientists, these are famous believers in God. Not all of them are Christians, but they do believe in God, whether uh, some of them are um, Jews or or just believing in, in a divine transcendent being, um, but falls short from labeling him as, as Jesus Christ. But these are the famous scientists that actually are believers in medieval Europe. These are the leading figures of science in modern history. And they were all believers. They believed that a divine being exists and must exist. Why is that? Because you, I'm not saying there are no scientific, uh, scientists in, in, in in, in Buddhism or Hinduism, but what is the world for a, a, an Eastern philosopher or, or a Buddhist or a Hindu? The world is what? It's not real. The world is an illusion. That's what they believe in. So how can you study something that doesn't exist? You see? So, and, and we can go to different cultures and how they viewed, but, but Christianity, Christ, or God created the world, and also uh, correct to say Christ created the world, God created the world through Christ, um, as a reasonable wor world and as a real world. And only these two conditions can help scientists study the world in a scientific, or the physical world that is in a scientific way, if it's real and rational. So the verdict, I'll leave that, and now I'll pause and I'll get your, uh, your feedback. Remember we asked a question in the beginning, Christianity and science, friends or foes, allies or enemies, 
Now we've expounded upon several discussions and topics and, and I hope I've given you some ideas about the relationship. What is the verdict? What do you all think? Are there any reservations? What do you think if you were to summarize a statement, the verdict at the end, what would you say? I think they're both front and both. Explain. I mean, okay. Explain briefly. <clears throat> um, you know, like, like you said, uh, I speak, mean, speak in the mic. Like you said, at one hand, you, it seems to be a, these scientists with their atheists trying to contradict what, what, what God's creation and what's going on in the world. At the other hand, you know, science that's going on, there are new developments going on, are coming from Christ himself. You know? Very good. So what would you say? Friends or foes? Or I both? They're both. Both, okay. Anyone else? Friends. Huh? Friends. Some? Friends. <coughs> Can you very briefly explain? Uh, I do see it as a perfect circle where if someone needs to deny it, then that's his decision. That uh, basically, if you start at one end, you have to end up at the end. So you start at science, you have to believe in Christianity. Right. Start in Christianity, then science for you is what is basically not convincing, but it's just based on whatever you believe. Very good. Well said. Well, I also want to mention to you, and I give you an analogy. I love analogies and stories because they illustrate concepts and theories and bring it to um, more understandable. So let's say I have, pretend this is a calculator and this is a computer. And then I look at this calculator and I say, you know what? The internet doesn't exist because I cannot surf the internet with my calculator. Therefore, the internet doesn't exist. Do you see where I'm going? So this is used as a calculator to deal with numbers, values, and integers, right? Computers are used to deal with, well, many other things, but one of which is the internet, okay? So, because I can't use the internet with the calculator doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It simply means I am just using the wrong tool to discover reality. Do you see what I'm saying? From that, I can say that science and Christianity are not enemies. They're just different tools for different things. You take this and you take that and then you come to the common author of both. And this is what I wanted to share with you. That God, as I mentioned last night, has written two books, the scriptures. Well, actually more than that. He revealed himself in the creation, the scriptures. Actually, I, re I uh, and please say it and correct me if I say anything wrong. Um, I always like to say that God has revealed himself to us with the four C's. I call them the four C's. And I made up the fourth C. But first, through create, and you read this in Romans 1, creation. The second C in Romans 2, conscience. The third C, the perf perfectly speaking, in Romans 3, Christ. But there's another C. I call it, uh, it's the scriptures, but just so that we can easily under, <laughs> remember it, I say the canons of the scriptures. So God revealed himself through creation, conscience, scriptures, or canons of scriptures, and Christ. So he revealed himself in so many different ways. Now it's up to us to have uh, tuned ears to his revelation, or as St. Paul says in some uh, in Timothy, itching ears that don't want to listen to the truth. So the scriptures and nature the scriptures get, gives, give you theology, which is the relationship between God and His creation, us. Okay, us. Um, and then He also gave us nature, from which we have the study of the discipline of science, and that's the relationship between us and the creation. Now, the, the author of both is the same. God. Now, where does the problem lie here? Right, right there. Interpretation. That's why we have so many different denominations and so many different sects and so on and so forth is because we interpret not according to what the author intended, but according to what we think or like. Okay? 
Why we have so many problems here? Because how we interpret science. Do you get now the, did you get this? I think this sums it up, right? All right, so with that, I'd like to say that science and Christianity are friends, are complementary to one another. You, they may seem to be foes or, or enemies simply because we use them differently for different purposes, not the purposes that were intended to be used. Here's the verse. This is the, I, I wanted to make sure I include this because this is the verse of the convention, by the way. Isn't it? This is yeah. the verse we agreed on. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, and here's my, the, the most important word in this, clearly, clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Clearly seen. You have to be blind not to see the attributes of God in his creation.